Uh, so my name is Elon, and this is Ben, and we're some of the organizers of the Seeing the Strings Collective, um, which is a collective uh, essentially of people kind of that are organizing these series, which are currently entitled Seeing the Strings, a series of teachings on the oppressions that hold capitalism up. Um, and of course, we want to acknowledge that we're an unceded co-status territory, and this is very important to kind of think about the spaces we inhabit and the way that, of course, we operate within them. Um, so we came together, this collective, uh, as uh, we came together and are still coming together as a collective because we're continually open, uh, louder, okay, okay awesome. Uh, because we saw a lack of meaningful deliberation in Vancouver on how capitalism operates, its reliance on both visible and invisible forms of domination and exploitation in order to function. Um, we came together because we were and continue to see are frustrated with the discourse and the rhetoric that we often hear um, within our movements, they go something along the lines of, you know, we'll deal with issues of racism and sexism after the, off the revolution, after these battles. Right now what you're doing is that you're uh, putting effort and energy away from the real issues. And that's the kind of rhetoric that we're trying to address today. And so we're here to learn uh, why it is that capitalism can either be reduced to the predatory practices of Wall Street banks, nor is it something which simply or merely intersects with race, gender, and sexual oppression. Capitalism is a system based on a gendered and racialized division of labor, resources, and suffering. Violent and deprivation and premature death are structural aspects of an economic system which requires that some work and some do not, some receive care and some do not, some survive and others die. The celebration of cultural diversity, the recognition of cultural difference, and the applauding of women and people of color and queers entering the workspace and the relative decline of overtly racist and sexist attitudes among the younger generations is something that's nice and good, um, but it has not improved uh, exact. It has not improved to such the extent. Instead, it has merely masked the dramatic deterioration of the material circumstances of marginalized populations. So we're here together, as we have come together in the past, to learn from each other as friends and to see how these oppressions are mutually constituting. Um, there cannot be a disruption of the status quo, of the violence of capitalism, how it perpetuates without targeting, challenging, and exposing the systems of oppression that support this system. Sweet. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce this event, Capitalism and Patriarchy. It's our third. Uh, the first event explored what capitalism, capitalism is and how it affects us each differently. Uh, the second looked at how colonialism shaped capitalism and how it continues uh, to this day. And then our next event at the end of June is Capitalism and Ecology. It's going to be outside and we're looking to get uh, food not bombs and make it more interactive uh, for next time. But tonight we have some excellent speakers. Amy Hanser is the Associate Professor of Sociology at UBC. Her work deals with um, China. Uh, Culture and workers' rights, gender consumption, and service work. Uh, Mary Sherman is a PhD candidate at SFU. Um, she's in the, in the Department of Women's Studies, Gender and Sexuality, and is doing a longitudinal study on feminine sexuality and expression. Uh, finally, Esther Shannon is a longtime feminine, feminine activist um, working with community based organizations. Um, on all kinds of issues. She's also a feminist journalist and a researcher. She's a founding member of FIRST, a national coalition um, advocating for decriminalization of sex work. Um, so tonight we'll be hearing all about the histories, relationships, and effects of capitalism on gender. Um, but honestly, as a straight white guy, um, this is something that never quite piqued my interest. Um, not excusing myself, just saying I didn't expect to be here. Um, but even I can tell you, there's, <laughs> there's, something, uh, there's something seriously uh, uh, wrong here. And, and um, you know, with our relationships around gender, they're seriously um, boxed. And so um, it extends beyond the economic, economic system. It's integrated into our daily lives and language. Uh, we all know that gender roles are BS, but it does require a bit of unlearning. Um, and that's something we have to do even within our own movements. Uh, some might go to the, the movement to end all movements, uh, call it Occupy, expecting it to be free of these things, but often finding that it's not. And I think we should expect the opposite. You know, we have to recognize our role in creating these moments, and, and they are uh, consciously created every time we get together. 
Um, and so doing it just once doesn't end the drive to address it, expose it, and challenge it, um, and replace it again and again. So with that in mind, we try, we're trying to create a safe space as possible. Um, and yeah, we ask folks to check their privilege at the door, listen up to our anti-oppression statement, um, so that we all have an understanding on how to conduct ourselves here tonight as a community. And if you have any concerns about safety or accessibility, you can ask us or Margaret and Rin at the door. Everyone, would you please welcome Amy Hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought first I would just take a moment to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak. Um, and I'll, just to give you a sort of a sense of what I'm going to do today, um, I'm a sociologist who works at UBC, and one of the areas that I both research and teach about is gender and work. Um, and most of my, my actual research has been in China, um, but when I teach, I teach about Canadian economy and society, and so that's what that will be my starting point today. I'll restrict myself to um, using uh, Canadian society as an example, um, but that's not really the area that I do research in. Um, and what I thought I'd do with my time, or actually your time, uh, that I've been given today, is this. I'm going to start by saying just a little bit about the title for today's meeting. Uh, capitalism and patriarchy, because it gave me some pause when I was asked to present, and, and I'll, I'll give you a little sense of, uh, from a sociologist, from a perspective, the perspective of sociology, um, why I wrote gender and economy in my title as opposed to capitalism and patriarchy. And then what I want to do is give you some, uh, offer you some insights from sociology and uh, what sociology and other social sciences have to offer us in terms of thinking about how gender shapes the economy. And then, um, and what it means in terms of inequality. And so what I'm going to do is actually show you a fair number of tables, um, not to panic you if you don't like numbers. I'm actually a qualitative sociologist, so I don't deal with quantitative data very often, but it's very effective in capturing some of these broad patterns that I, um, that I want to identify uh, in my talk today. And in particular, I want to suggest that um, that sociology gives us a way of thinking about gender and the economy and asking the kinds of questions about uh, how we should understand this form of, of social inequality. So, for example, um, what kind of social activities are considered productive? What's not considered productive? How does labor get divided up in society and how do we reward it? Uh, and I personally think you can't actually answer those questions adequately without taking into account gender relations, although, of course, not only gender relations. So if I can have my next slide. Um, so I, I want to start first, though, with the terms capitalism and patriarchy. Um, because these are actually, they were quite evocative for me when I thought about them together. Uh, the, the first term, capitalism, is usually used to understand and sometimes to critique a particular economic system, whereas the second term, patriarchy, refers to social systems where men dominate women. And in sociology, these terms were first paired together in the 1970s when feminist scholars began to critique existing Marxist theories of inequality by arguing that those theories didn't, um, which focused upon paid labor as a site of inequality and exploitation, the, the argument was that theories of capitalism didn't take into account the specificity of women's experiences in society, and in particular, the often unpaid labor in which women engaged. So whereas Marxist critiques of capitalism examined the division of labor, and especially paid labor, Theories of patriarchy often take the sexual division of labor as its starting point. And this sexual division of labor was actually, it was posited that the sexual division of labor came prior to capitalism and actually served as a kind of template or a model for exploitation out of which capitalism was able to grow. So, and the, these were uh, theories that people were working with and looking at historical data, in particular in the 1970s. And the result, if I can have my next slide, was, um, oh, we jumped ahead, <laughs> but that's okay, you can just leave it there. The, the result was what's called a dual systems approach. There was this idea that there were these two separate systems, capitalism and patriarchy, and they interact, and so you get these, um, you get these uh, interacting uh, oppressions, class oppression and gender oppression. Um, now, uh, how we think about inequality today has become much more complex, and that's the reason why I felt uncomfortable using the term, in, in particular, uh, 
just using the terms capitalism and patriarchy, because for me, they mean this dual systems approach, two systems, these kind of two universal systems. Um, and today, in particular, we recognize that there's lots of other um, forms of inequality that intersect. And so I, I, I use the term intersectionality. That's a, a, a common term meant to capture all of these different ways that inequality acts, race, age, disability, sexuality, all sorts of things. Um, so in other words, my feeling is that we have to be very cautious about making universalizing pronouncements, like all women have this circumstance or all men have that circumstance. And so it's partly for that reason that I will mostly use the terms gender and economy, although I feel as I do that I'm sort of depoliticizing what I'm saying. So I want to, but, but that's, that's where I'm coming from, from a particular perspective. Despite all of those concerns about overgeneralizing and suggesting coherence of systems that's maybe a lot more complex than, than it would initially appear and so forth, we can see general patterns. Uh, we can see gen general gendered patterns in the economy. And so that's what I'm going to try and outline for you tonight in a really, uh, in the most basic um, generalized terms. Uh, and, and I'll say a little bit at the end about how, um, how we can complicate some of what I've presented as well. So if I can have my next slide. Okay, so maybe you can actually see this. Um, okay, so then the question becomes, how does gender structure the economy? And if we're talking about um, uh, paid employment, um, how does gender structure employment more specifically? And when we look at um, paid labor, we find clear evidence of what we might call a gendered division of labor. So uh, if you look at this table, for example, you can, I've, I've separated out, the data's from 2006. So my apologies that I haven't updated it with the most recent census data. Um, but in, I've listed the, the, the general occupational categories in which women are underrepresented, overrepresented, and roughly equal. Um, and you can, I, I, I don't think I really need to say a whole lot, but you can sort of see how gender uh, uh, is inherent in these categories of um, trades, transport, construction, overwhelmingly male, um, whereas uh, secretaries are overwhelmingly female. Um, so it seems like a very simple observation um, to see that men and women seem to be um, concentrated in different occupations. But in fact, this is a really important observation from a sociological point of view. The division of men and women into different occupations or different types of jobs is one of the most marked and enduring aspects of our economy. It is a fundamental way in which our economy is structured. Generally, we call this sex segregation, if you can flip to my next slide. Um, though we should probably call it gender segregation, or, or that's the term I would be more comfortable with. It's a pattern that endures across cultures and across historical time periods. So in fact, although the specific contours of sex segregation have changed, and they can vary remarkably across time and place. So the actual, what's actually in the, the, the masculine category and the feminine category varies enormously. But the, the division into those categories is um, itself uh, virtually a constant. You find it everywhere. More, most recently, there's a pair of sociologists who've examined employment data from a large number of countries around the world in an effort to better understand, you know, how does this work? What, what is it that uh, characterizes the jobs that women tend to be channeled into? And what characterizes the jobs that men tend to be channeled, channeled into? And they have argued that women and men get distributed into different types of work in two ways. The first way is uh, uh, in which sex segregation tends to operate is what's called horizontal sex segregation. So if you could give me my next. Um, and then the next one, too. Thanks. Um, this term basically refers to the separation of men and women into jobs that are perceived as prototypically masculine or feminine types of work. So in other words, women are channeled into jobs that are perceived as appropriate jobs for women, often in the non-manual sectors of the economy, especially the service sector. And men get channeled into jobs that are considered appropriate for men, um, sometimes in manual labor, but not necessarily. So in other words, jobs are often seen as having a gendered character and as being more suitably filled by either men or women. And as a result, employers tend to hire workers who fit their idea of the appropriate worker and workers tend to be drawn to appropriately gendered jobs or occupations. 
Um, and I'm going to, sh you know, I'll show you evidence from, from Canada that this happens, but um, there's really interesting studies globally looking at global manufacturing, for example, that make the case that employers have this idea that certain jobs, women and men are suited for certain jobs, and they really seek them out globally. Wow. Uh, uh, somewhat complex story, but it's an important way that the global uh, labor market is organized. Okay, um, so because women have historically been slower to enter the paid labor force, and because women have ex historically been considered less suited to paid labor, horizontal se sex segregation has traditionally meant that women are often crowded into a relatively small number of occupations. And in Western countries especially, women have been largely excluded from high-paying jobs in the manual labor sector. That's one area in particular that they've been uh, um, shut out of. So uh, if, you, if you can show me, show the next slide. This is actually probably too small to read carefully. But essentially what it does is the very first grouping of five occupations were, are the top five occupations for women in 1901 in Canada. Um, and, and it's hard to read, but it's domestic servants, um, seamstresses, school teachers, office, office clerks, and farmers. And 71.1% of women were in those just those five occupations. They were extremely concentrated. Then if we move to 1951, we have uh, stenographers and typists, office clerks, sales clerks, hotel, uh, cafe, and private household workers. So that includes domestic workers and school teachers represented 43.8% of women in the paid labor force. And then in 1996, the top five occupations were retail salespersons, secretaries, cashiers, registered nurses, and accounting clerks. And that represented uh, only 19.5% of women workers. So partly what you see there is that as women have uh, position in the labor market has improved, they're less concentrated. Um, but we're also using, I think, uh, narrower categories of occupation. So some of this is um, hard to compare across time periods, but it does show that, that historically ideas about women's appropriateness for paid labor resulted in an extreme concentration in a, a very small sector of the labor market. Um, we should also keep in mind that simply looking at occupation level data is actually likely to underestimate the amount of sex segregation that actually exists in the labor market and in the workplaces. And this is because there's often quite a bit of sex segregation within occupations as well. And so I didn't include those tables because it takes a while to look through them, and I'm not sure how well you could see. But if we took an occupation where there was a fairly even representation of men and women, like the retail sector, for example, if you look more closely at what men and women do, so what kinds of stores do they work in, very segregated. And then once you get into the store, what kind of work do men and women do? Also very segregated. And that's true for so many occupations. Medicine, business, um, teaching, huge uh, pattern. The, the closer you look at an occupation, the more likely you are to find that men and women are uh, being channeled into different specializations. Um, so uh, if I can have the next slide. Do you take questions on this? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, on that last slide, Can we please? go back? Um, first, what percentage in those three areas are women... How many women were in the uh, workforce? In the paid, paid yeah. women, of, of the women that are paid, mm -hmm. is it like 5% of the women are paid in, in 1910? Uh, it's a good 40% in 51 and 80% in 80? Like, I don't actually know, but what you've suggested would, would add a column to this that would probably highlight... Well, it would put it in proportion. That's right. It would show that, um, that a lot of women were actually uh, not not working, but were not working for pay. So that's part of the shift that's actually not represented in this data, is the large movement of women into the workforce. Um, that's uh, Into the paid workforce, I should say. Not, um, uh, and that's part of this shift as well. So it's a good question. I can't actually... I don't actually know. I'd have to go back and, and get and the sense. The other question, really important, uh -huh. how many of them are happy? <laughs> well, you know, the census doesn't, With their just doesn't ask that. <laughs> That's a good question. It, it, maybe it should be a question on the census. Um, it would be interesting. Uh, I, 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 could, I could go on a tangent, but I'm okay, I'm done. <laughs> so next slide, please. So that's the first way, uh, the first form of sex segregation, and we see it everywhere, that men and women get channeled into these kind of gender-type jobs. So the argument that um, has been made is that there's a second form of sex segregation, vertical sex segregation, which means the sorting of men and women into 
the sorting of men into higher status, higher paying jobs relative to women because they're seen as better workers or more competent in some way. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's evidence, uh, I'm going to show you old data because um, I haven't taught this material in a while and I haven't gone and updated, like I said, with the new census data. But um, if you give me my next slide, it's going to be really hard to read. So I will tell you effectively what this slide does. This slide shows um, for 1995 top 16 highest paying occupations in Canada. And it shows you know, what the average income is, uh, what, women, what men's average income is, what women's average income is, what percentage, what the ratio is of those incomes, um, number of people in those occupations, and the percentage of those workers who are women. Um, in general, when you look at high paid occupations, women's representation is very low. But if, even if you look at an occupation where women's representation is fairly high, and unfortunately my color addition fancy stuff has blocked out the figures, but if you look at the category securities, agents, investment dealers, and traders, a very you know, well-paid financial occupation, women, in, in 1995, women were about 35% of that occupation, but they earned only 52% of what men earned. And, and, and if you actually look at this table carefully, you actually find that, that the higher the women's rep representation in a particular occupation, the smaller their ratio of pay is, generally speaking. Um, so, uh, so it's, and again, you, you know, you can't generalize uh, in, 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 across all of these occupations, but it's a general pattern um, that we do see that in higher pay occupations, women's representation tends to be lower. Um, that doesn't mean that there's low paid occupations that are heavily male, there are. But in the very highest paid occupations, women are underrepresented. Okay. Um, so, it's important to note, and I just, I just observe, um, oh right, so this is actually, uh, I'll get to this in just a second. Um, it's important to note that horizontal sex segregation means difference. It doesn't necessarily mean inequality, but it often, uh, it, it often translates in, into inequality. Vertical sex segregation means inequality in terms of how workers are evaluated, how much they get paid. I'm probably moving around in here. Oh, no. um, uh, so the idea is that horizontal sex segregation could mean difference, but it doesn't necessarily mean that women are disadvantaged economically in the labor market. Vertical sex segregation means economic disadvantage. And we see both of those patterns, horizontal and vertical, we see them everywhere, but in different proportions. So some societies have a lot of uh, horizontal sex segregation, but the gap in men's and women's pay isn't very large. Um, but you'll, you can find other, other places where the horizontal sex segregation is lower, but vertical, vertical sex segregation is high. They don't necessarily vary in that way, but there are two ways in which um, this ordering of men and women in the labor market happens. Okay, so then the question becomes, why does it matter? Who cares? Um, well, if inequality is involved, we, we care, and that's basically um, the main reason, I would argue, we should care about sex segregation is because one of the, one of the things it does is it creates uh, what's called a wage gap. So this is, um, this is a table that I, I just made using the most recent data I could find from Statistics Canada. So it goes from 1976 to 2009. And you can see for full-time, full-year workers, it sh sh gives you on the, on the end there, percentage, it's the ratio of... Uh, that women earn of men's pay. So in 1976, women earned roughly 59.4%. The average woman's pay was 59.4%, was, was the average man's pay. By 2009, it was 74.6%. Uh, um, you know, it's been steadily growing, but it, it's a slow, <laughs> that's a long time, time frame, and it's a slow increase. Um, this is a super crude way of representing this because there's so much variation. There's so many people who don't work full time. There's so much complexity that doesn't get reflected here. But these general numbers give you a, a sense of um, uh, a disparity in average pay across men and women. Um, and sociologists argue that the major cause for this pay disparity is sex segregation. It's the fact that men and women don't do the same work and that overall men's work is paid higher. Um, and there's lots of uh, ways we can take on that, tackle that particular question. But these are the general patterns we, we see. Sex segregation in these two ways, horizontal and vertical, and then a resulting wage gap uh, that is um, enduring and persistent, even in a time when I think many women in the labor market maybe don't think of themselves as disadvantaged. Uh, the, the wage gap is actually still persistent. Uh, and it's actually an issue that UBC is 
wrestling with right now because there is a, an unexplainable gap between men and women professors pay at UBC. When they try and control for everything that might explain it, they can't explain away something like 10% of the, 10 or 15% of the difference in pay. So um, <laughs> it's, it's the, this is what sociologists love to do, right? <laughs> What's the part you can't explain? That's discrimination. Um, <laughs> so so it, is, it is a phenomenon that's still with us today. If you solve it, will you get a raise? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, probably not. Because <laughs> you're a woman? <laughs> but I can, I can make a case. So anyway, these concepts, sex segregation, both vertical and horizontal, and the gendered wage gap, um, they paint a very rough picture of gender in the economy. And a, fine, a finer grained look raises all sorts of more complex issues and also shows how gender inequality is modified or shaped by lots of other social categories and other factors. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. In a way, I feel like I've presented you with the most boring part of gender in the economy. And there's so much interesting stuff when people actually go and study workplaces, the history of labor markets. Um, all of this stuff is really interesting. Um, but it all falls under or within the context of these larger patterns. So for example, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, example one, we know based on recent research that women with children, mothers, may actually be more disadvantaged in the labor market than women without children. In fact, childless women might even be considered by employers as making better hire, you know, when employers are hiring, they might actually think of childless women as a better choice than single men. And there's a study that suggests that there is this kind of hierarchy where men with families are considered most desirable and often offered the highest wages. Then we have single women. Then we have single men. They're a little less reliable. Why aren't they tied down with family? And then mothers are at the bottom. Least desirable, lowest pay. So the, the researchers who did that study argue that there's what they call... <laughs> motherhood penalty, which is obviously a, a variation on what I've, I've, I've told you here, right? That fa people's family status matters. Or, to give you another example, we know that one of the reasons that the wage gap between men and women has shrunk is not just that women's wages have risen, but that working class men have experienced a stagnation or even a drop in earning power. So, um, however you want to think about that, um, that is uh, a little bit, uh, it's, it's a much less rosy story than thinking women are, you know, catching up, is that working class men have lost earning power, and that's part of the story in, in these figures as well. Like I said, these are very crude figures for capturing that kind of subtlety. And then I'll give you just one more example. Um, we know also, for example, that masculinity, um, and jobs being typed as masculine does not always mean um, a kind of benefit for men. So for example, there have been a number of people who've studied occupations where they find that the, the, the jobs that are particularly strongly associ associated with masculinity, um, often, uh, um, they often pay men less and involve more danger. So that it's almost like um, the, the masculine part of the job is part of the wage, right? That people will get a kind of boost to their identity. And one of the studies was of um, people who fight forest fires. Extremely dangerous work. Probably not paid enough given the risks that people face. Um, but that, it be, that the, the gendered nature of the job actually makes it more attractive. It makes people more likely to take jobs that are exploitative because, um, because it, it affirms their gender identity in some way. That really, all of those kinds of little stories really complicate the picture I've told. And of course, I haven't added in anything other than gender, really, into this, into this picture. And that makes the, 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 the story even more complex. Um, hence my discomfort with using large systematic terms, because there's, um, institutions are so complex and there's so many ways that people's lives are, are, sh are shaped. Um, OK, I'm probably out of time, but if we can go to skip this one and this one. Um, those were just ways of thinking a little bit about recessions as being gendered. Um, I just want to conclude um, by making a quick set of observations and raising a few questions, um, and in particular being inspired by uh, the work of an economist uh, from New Zealand named Marilyn Waring. Um, in part because I've, today I've, I've just talked about paid work, and there's an enormous amount that falls out of the picture when we limit ourselves to job, work that gets done for pay. 
Now, Marilyn Waring, in her writings, she asks a critical set of questions for those of us who are concerned about social inequality. So, for example, she asks, why is it that labor that is unpaid or that does not involve a market transaction is not considered productive? It doesn't get recorded. The government doesn't record it in more figures of economic activity. Why is it that economics is unable to assign values to things like unpolluted water supplies or the preservation of the environment? Why is it that a woman who cares for her own children without pay is considered unproductive in data on economic activity, whereas a woman who looks after other people's children is recorded as economically active in government statistics? So if you could give me my last slide. Um, in other words, what are the values that markets recognize and create? Why is it that economics is only able to see these values? How do we measure the value of a clean environment or safety and well-being? or of, of a pristine forest. Waring notes, and here I quote her, she says, the system of economic accounting says that forests, rainfall, water resources, fossil fuels, seafood, soil, grasslands, and the quality of the air we breathe are worthless when preserved for future generations. It is their use, exploitation, and payment from them in the market which establishes their validity. And in fact, we do the same thing with people. So Waring lodges a similar critique with the accepted definitions of work and labor that are used to measure economic activity. The kinds of activities that are both labeled as work and measured as producing value are those activities that involve the exchange of money or at least a market exchange of some kind. A country's labor force is generally defined by those, as those people working in the formal labor market, people who are paid for their work, as well as those people seeking to find employment in the formal labor market. The same activity performed in the context of the private home and the public work setting can be differently defined as unproductive and productive. And she makes the joke at one point that the man who uh, marries his housekeeper has a negative effect on the gross national product that, because her, her work doesn't count anymore and she's married. Um, she doesn't get paid. <laughs> so um, a meal prefer, prefer, prepared for one's own family is not seen to contribute value to society or to, to the economic welfare of a country, whereas a meal prepared as a wage laborer will appear as productive activity in the ledger of national accounts. And I feel like these questions are important. When we talk about gender and the economy, we have to recognize just by saying economy, we cut out this huge area of activity that people engage in that is, in fact, labor. And uh, Wary makes the observation that one of the definitions of labor is to produce a child. Um, but that the woman who gives birth to a child, she's not actually considered to have produced anything in terms of the economy. Um, so what Rary is basically doing is pointing to, pointing to the distinction that has been made between production and reproduction. Reproductive labor includes all those activities to re reproduce people, and people are the basis of productive labor. So without reproduction, production cannot, of course, take place. And you can probably think of lots of labor you engage in in your own life that... Um, doesn't, isn't visible in, in an economic sense. So Marilyn Waring's concern is to reveal how economics currently operates as a kind of worldview that makes much of the value, much of the valuable aspects of our world and much of the labor, especially of women, invisible and seemingly worthless. Um, and, and I feel like these are really useful questions to repeatedly come back to. Um, and it sort of turns my talk on its head in a way. Um, but what value does the market recognize? What doesn't it recognize? And um, in my talk today, I have left out a huge amount of labor that doesn't, um, doesn't get included in census, uh, census data. Okay, I think I've probably t gone over my time, so I'll stop.
Nine-ish. Nine All right, I want to be respectful of people's time. Yeah, so that's a few minutes. Five to nine? Five to nine, does that work for everyone? Okay, perfect. We want our part to be as interactive as possible. It's a work in progress, so please forgive our stumbles. Um, and we have an idea of what we want to talk about, which is that uh, we came here uh, with five questions slash topics to discuss. Um, but we also recognize that you came here for a reason, and we want to honor that and talk to speak to whatever uh, you're expecting to hear, want to talk about as much as possible. Um, and we are not the experts of how you experience these issues, your lived realities, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to make room for that. Um, we have PowerPoint for your information uh, to, and to help us go through the presentation, which we're kind of going to arbitrarily change the slide every three minutes or so. Um, I've got a timer and we'll signal you. Um, we have a couple handouts to also inform and help spark discussions. Thank you, Esther. Um, so, I just wanted to say one thing. I quickly um, looked over this pamphlet. It's very informative and it's written in a very accessible way and it, it, it speaks to a few things that um, that we are not going to be talking about that are part of the framework of capitalism um, so you know if you see this around pick it up it's it's useful do you want to ask the first topic okay so as um, uh, Mary said We've got five questions for you, and um, and and I, I also want to say that um, Amy's presentation is tremendously important because it provides a really strong foundation for some of the status in the economy, which is, as she noted, going through some changes. Um, as is men's status in the economy, and. Um, so, uh, and, and we're going to be talking about capitalism, we're going to be talking about a little bit about class, and we're also going to be talking about community solidarity. And the thing is, we might not get to all of those things, um, but we'll see how it goes. So the very first question, and Mary is going to do the flip chart, um, because I can't spell. And I'm not embarrassed by that. Um, right. Neither can Margaret Apple. And she is embarrassed. <laughs> um, so anyway, here's our first question. What do you know about the global economy right now? <coughs> Done? Just shout it out. Anything you know about the global economy today? Yesterday, tomorrow? Based on inequality? No, Just her. what's going on in the world financially, economically. Too much debt. Too much debt. Okay. Subsidies. No, Subsidies. No. It's in trouble. We're in trouble. <laughs> Recession. Recession. Segregated. Sorry? Segregated. Segregated. Working for survival. Yeah, working for survival. Extension of the extension of the class. Unsustainable. Unsustainable. Yeah. Uh, rise of new uh, economic powers, China and India. India and China are rising. Did you say? Yeah. Rising. Yeah. Yeah. Movement of student protests. There's a movement of student rallies going on. Protests, yeah, yeah. It's like it's based on fear. Based on fear, yeah. It's working just exactly as it was engineered. Working as it was engineered. <laughs> back at the back. Yeah. Human rights violations. Human rights violations. Globalization. Globalization. Yeah. Hierarchies. 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 Wage slavery. Come on, please. Ownership is being consolidated in fewer and fewer hands. Consolidated ownership. One giant uh, data reserve. One giant. Native or uh, I don't know, First Nations reserve. The entire North America is like slave to growth resources. Sorry. 
just can't hear what you said. Never mind. Well, um, were you saying that we're all being tucked into some kind of reserve that kind of looks like a yeah, First Nations reserve? Separate it from our environment? Yeah. Food security. Food security. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a growing, yes, uh, increasing global inequality because uh, rich nation is uh, rising, becoming more richer, or just less. Those uh, poor nations becomes more poor, and uh, uh, lots of debts. Great. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. Migrant labor. Yeah. Distractions and misinformation. Distractions and misinformation. Yeah. Class warfare. Okay, we're going to move on. Just want to say a couple of things um, uh, about the global economy. Uh, it's in really deep trouble. It's in what we know, what we call a crisis. On the way here, um, I heard on the radio the U.S government job figures. And they have gone down again, strongly gone down, after four months, the past four months, of disappointing returns, meaning um, they have now gone dramatically down. So unemployment is not coming back to America. Um, unemployment is very high here as well. 10.5%, um, 14 and a half percent of kids, youth can't find a job. Um, they get, economists get interested in job rates during a recession. They might not care what kind of work we do all the rest of the time, but in a recession, um, job rates really point to the health of the economy. Um, we know that Ireland is in a referendum right now. They're going to, are they going to accept um, the uh, provisions of the euro market that will allow their that will that will change their economic framework? That will mean that they will lose. Uh, they'll have to do cutbacks um, and uh, um, uh, and do all kinds of things to bring their status uh, back to. Um, health, which actually never really works. We know that Greece is in a crisis for the same kind of reason. We know that Germany is expected to take care of everybody and can it. We know that China has been the engine of the global economic health and it's actually falling back um, in its economic performance. Um, and we know that the United States is in an extraordinarily polarized political environment, which is making it extraordinarily difficult for them to uh, really address the weaknesses in their economy. So, uh, picking up on the point that was made about it's being, uh, the global economy is exactly as it was engineered to be. We can have the next slide, please. Uh, we now want to talk about who's controlling it. Because somebody had to engineer it, correct? So where's the control coming from? It's the invisible hand. Invisible hand? Alright. I'll take it. And? IMF. IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Nice. Four major There's a woman that heads that, by the way. She makes over. 480 grand a year, and she didn't pay any taxes. The 13 families forming the dark cabal, the 300, and it's it's like a pyramid scheme that breaks down um, to different levels, from the 33rd masonry level to, and it's it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, way of segregating people. Okay. Um, any anybody else? Who who else? Who's got their hands on the levers? Global corporations. Global corporations. And who owns them? The thirteen. Networks of executives. Networks of executives. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be. I don't know. We're going to be a 
it's tricky here because I don't really know much about this, but I suppose in a way we sort of control it. Sorry? Um, I, don't, I don't know about, maybe I'm being stupid because I don't know enough about this, but... You're not stupid. Uh, okay, um, in a way it's us that have created this because we decided to be involved in it and didn't pick a different path for ourselves. Uh, so how would you describe us? Who is us? What um, is it me. Class? Okay, so what role do individuals have in these issues, in these problems? What about rich men? What about rich white men? Rich white women? Um, well, as we happen to know that out of the Forbes 400, the wealthiest, wealthiest people in America, 400 of them, they're mostly all billionaires, some of them extraordinarily, extraordinarily wealthy billionaires, and the rest of them kind of around one or two billion. There's 38 women on that list. 36 of them got their wealth by marriage or inheritance. Only two women on the Forbes 400, this is 2011, are self-made women. Anybody got a guess who they might be? Oprah. One of them is very famous. <laughs> Oprah, the riches, uh, Walmart. <laughs> the Walmart family women um, are in the group of 36 women who got their money by marriage or inheritance. Another Queen self, Elizabeth. She's not on the Forbes 400, but she's very <laughs> because it's an American thing. The other woman, the other self-made woman, is a woman by the name of Meg Whitman. She came out at eBay, and she um, is now working as the CEO at Hewlett Packard, and she's trying to rescue that company. And she's being paid, she's accepted to be paid for one dollar a year on her mission. And my question is, would any male CEO work for a dollar a year? I mean, Jimmy Patterson worked for a dollar a year when he was putting together Expo, but he got some benefits. <laughs> and May is going to get some benefits as well, as long as Stuart Packard doesn't. She's going to sell her stock before everybody else does. And get one. Sorry? She'll Sorry? sell her stocks and her dividends or whatever before, before the suckers do, and then get out to anybody else. Alone. It's the same with us, all CEOs, but there's no progressive CEOs. Not like women CEOs are better than male CEOs. Yeah, I don't think there's a uh, good, bad, good, better. Um, I lost some. Um, so, I mean, I'm just saying that what we truly know is when it comes to huge wealth, it is uh, white males who control that level of wealth. And it's an extraordinary level of wealth that we're talking about. Um, so um, I think we can move on. Yeah, we can start the uh, Would the number 86% that the 13 families own, that's what Drunvalo Melchizedek, the spokesperson for the Mayan people, and he's extremely well informed, that's what he said. Did you say 86 percent? And his background is mathematics and physics. I think it'd be pretty close. Well, I mean, we do know that 1 percent and 99 percent, and that's not It's actually um, not a point 0.1 of 1 percent. Yeah, you're right. And we also know that 20 percent of the, 20 percent of the population who are low income versus 20 percent of the population who are high income the, the, the gap between those groups of people is enormous. So, I mean, you don't have to be filthy rich to have a lot of money. Um, it does help to have a lot of money. Anyway. So, um, go yeah. ahead. So, uh, we have some idea who controls the capitalist system. And we also always like to say that they get a two-four. They get to control the capitalist system, and they get to control the state. So um, we don't go into that at length, but um, we do think that the state signifies for capitalism. 
So anyway, so our next question is, who does not control this? We've been talking about um, capitalism. Who does not control capitalism? The bottom of the period, pyramid? At the bottom of the pyramid. The bottom of the period. pyramid. <laughs> Well, I must say that they're the ones that pay for it by their submission, by their compliance, yeah. by our participating in banks that are funding the war. Like it's, it all boils down that the capitalist system would, would bankrupt overnight if women absolutely refused to participate um, in, in a very thorough way. I, I think it would it would do that if everybody. It doesn't have to be. I mean, if we all refuse to participate, that would be a challenge. And actually, that's a piece of that is happening in Quebec right now. There's a lot. There's a refusal to participate in an economic decision uh, by a provincial government. Uh, so who else does not control this? The unemployed. So the unemployed. The unemployed? The people whose land it happens on. The people whose land it happens on? That the indigenous people? Indigenous people, we could say that they are the not control of the capitalist system. The children? The children don't control it. The mother, the class. Mothers. Mothers? For sure. And the homeless? Sorry? The homeless? The homeless? The animal kingdom. The animal kingdom. Queer and trans people. Queer and trans people. For sure, if you're transgender, you, you, you have an extraordinarily difficult time to find employment, let alone a mass fortune. Yes? People with mental health issues. Although, according to that uh, documentary that came up, the corporation, mm -hmm. by definition, the corporation is psychotic, so. <laughs> <laughs> All that's so good. Yeah, it has to be psychotic. Yeah. And people who don't understand the system? People who don't understand the system, that is a huge one. Yeah. That is a really big one. Uh, you're exploited and you don't even know you're being exploited. Yeah. Um, the regulation of our education system, how it's being down, especially the uh, high school. Mm -hmm. The dumbing down of education. So students, would you say students and teachers? Um, people who read the papers. People who read the papers. The, 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 uh, corporate media. They don't control, or they do? Well, they're they're programmed, right? So they've lost their personal control, and they're like clone behavior, right? Um, all the information I got for this presentation was from the corporate media. So <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a way that you can figure things out, and um, that's another big issue. The the ability of the system to keep us from figuring things out, uh, as someone else had said. So again, separations and divisions. Um, Police state. Oh, sorry? Police state. Police state, criminalization, as was said earlier. Yeah. Censorship, but innovative ideas could uh, cause collapse in existing police departments. Censorship. And actually, they do censor, but they don't actually have to because it is so profoundly difficult to to get any new idea accepted um, in in uh, in society. Yeah, I'm way back there. I think mm -hmm. most most of what's been mentioned could be considered violent, but just physical violence. Physical violence. violence. I haven't heard mentioned. Violence has yeah. Violence has control. Yeah. Violence has. I have a kind of quick list on that, um, sort of sums up what people have been saying. So, and this is the way we put it, hierarchy and othering, us, them, racism, sexism, classism, 
anti-immigration, anti-immigrant, homophobia, labor. There's a lot of uh, other in, of, of labor right now. The um, federal government has ordered back um, three major, uh, has undermined the right to strike by um, ordering back to work CP, uh, Air Canada and uh, Canada Post workers. Um, sure. Um, Amy and us, we, we all talk about inter interlocking intersectionality. All of these things, it's not like there's a sandwich and there's a piece of bread on top and there's a, then a piece of cheese and then there's a piece of meat and then there's the last piece of bread. It's not that kind of sandwich. It's more like a stew. And it's really hard to pull out what's operating at any given time. And it's really hard to understand how it all goes together. And uh, they don't actually want us to understand how it all goes together. Other people have talked about media and the advertising industry and the domination of that and how we are becoming, or we are actually now, a world of consumers, and that's how we're treated. And uh, it's begun, as uh, somebody said earlier, at babyhood, where moms just obey. Today was advertising, um, uh, come and visit our baby's room. I mean, baby's rooms, people, the whole notion of baby's rooms is now accepted. There is never a tremendous amount of attention to babies' rooms. All of the stuff around mothering, the constant focus on mothering, is really another form of commodified, commodified, yeah, um, commodification. commodification of mothering and of children. Um, and the sexualization of girls and women is huge. I mean, you know, there is no place that you can go today where you do not see women's bodies um, being used to sell products. And of course now we see that that's a market that's kind of exhausted and you probably know that the cosmetics industry has the highest markup on products of any other industry in the world. And now that industry is looking for a new market and we know who they are. You guys in the audience, you know, you better get that chest shaved. Yeah. And you better get that hair cut once in every month. And you better start using those skin enhancers. And uh, intentional hair removal is probably the biggest, most brilliant sort of consuming your gender uh, <laughs> capitalist project. And I'm good, like, I, that's not a known fact, it's just your hair grows back, even with. Well, paralysis, your hair grows back. So we all need to be hairless, i.e. we all need to throw money at it to be sexually desirable, all these other things. And there you have it. And the women are successfully removing their hair all the time, and now everyone else is doing it. It's yeah. not a lot of fun, I'll tell you that. I actually gave it up. Um, okay, I'm just losing it. Okay. Um, other people have talked about the elevation of the individual over the community. And the results of that are isolation and alienation, loss of civic participation and engagement, and a loss of knowledge. Well, you know, what is going on in the world? You know, who knows? And the other thing is passivity and fear and the creation and the exploitation of the risk society. And the way we understand that is the law and order agenda, the tough on crime agenda, which is about frightening people in a, a vast number of ways. Um, and then another really handy tool is cycles of freedom and oppression. Like I'm a lesbian, and um, at one point I was oppressed, but now I'm not oppressed, and I'm really happy. And about that, you know, and um, and uh, but then the immigrant next to me, 